Matthew 5 is our text. We're back in our series on rebels and looking at what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount over the last um, several weeks, several months, and um, so this morning we're going to dive back into it. Matthew 5, 27 to verse 30. Matthew 5, 27 to verse 30. And as you're turning there, imagine with me, you've got a daughter and her birthday wish or her Christmas gift that she wants is that she wants to have a little bunny for Christmas. And if you're like me and my wife, we've, we're fighting this for like years of cats and dogs and rub, rabbits and everything else. And I think one of these years our kids will finally win and get it. Um, but, um, but imagine finally you give your child, your daughter, this bunny, the bunny that she's been wanting for years. It's her pet. She does everything she does with that bunny. She takes care of it. This bunny lives in the lap of luxury, feasts on carrots and lettuce um, on top of a soft blanket inside this spacious cage. She's daily washed in the bathtub, even though the parents tell her not to do it. Um, she's dried with the parents' best towels. She's, um, the daughter uses her own hairbrush to brush the hair and take care of this bunny really, really well. Bunny will cuddle up in her lap while the girl reads aloud stories from Peter Rabbit or Alice in Wonderland, because what else would you read a bunny, right? Um, and so you're reading that, and then they watch Bugs Bunny together just so the bunny could have a future and hope of what could be there and um, all of this stuff. This daughter really, really loves this bunny. And then one day, the least favorite cousin shows up, right? The one that is truthful but a little too truthful um, and just is a passer bothers you all the time, and he goes, that's not a bunny. That's just a plain old rabbit. And a rabbit is nothing more than a rodent, a big-toothed big toothed rodent, a rat. You don't believe me? Look it up in the encyclopedia. Look it up online, and you'll see I'm right. Your little girl will be heartbroken. You're not going to argue with an encyclopedia, but deep down, she knows that if her treasured pet was reduced to a rat, it would lose all of its value. Love says this is a bunny. Her love recognizes, cherishes, magnifies worth. Love never cheapens worth. A beloved bunny can never become a rabbit, and a rabbit can never become a rodent. But lust is the opposite of love. Lust degrades something until it becomes disposable. Lust consumes stuff and then tosses the empty package away. When God created everything in Genesis, when he was done, he said, this is good. Everything is good. And the first command that he gives to the first couple, Adam and Eve, was be fruitful and multiply. Fill the whole earth and subdue it. See, God gave man and woman a sex drive. And he said that was good. God created it. He commanded them, be fruitful, multiply. But the sex drive of humans is completely different from the sex drive of the beast of the field. The animal is driven by a sex drive for two things only. Number one, to satisfy a sexual itch. And number two, to reproduce. But listen, our human sex drive, our human sexual desire is so much more than that. It's been given to produce a lifelong fusion between a man and a woman, intimacy that goes far deeper than an itch of an animal. To a child, a bunny is not a rodent. And a human created in the image of God is not an animal with an itch to satisfy. I can't remember who it was, but there's Several years ago, I was watching ESPN, there was an interview right after a football game, and they were interviewing this player, and the interview kept going on and on and on for a while. Multiple reporters were asking him questions. After several questions, the player got irritated. He grabbed a beer, and he said, now I'm going to go take a shower, I'm going to clean myself up, I'm going to go to a bar, and I'm going to find myself a woman. But listen, he wasn't looking for a woman. A woman, after all, is a human being of intelligence and beauty, and mystery, a human being made in the image of God. 
A man can't violate her without violating God and violating himself. This football player only wanted to satisfy or scratch his itch. Love exalts humanity. Lust diminishes them. Lust reduces it to an object or a tool or a toy or a plaything that is exploited and then disregarded when it's no longer useful. Love always wants the other person to thrive. Lust reduces the person who is lusted after to one thing that will satisfy my sexual wants or desires. And then it reduces the one who is lusting to a one-dimensional person, a single itch to be satisfied. And I'll do whatever I can to get that itch satisfied. Tragically, lust is a slave master. Let me repeat it. Your child, a bunny is not a rat. And God's redeemed children are not animals who live to scratch an itch. That's not what we are created for. God's love exalts us. God calls us to higher dimensions, to become sons and daughters of the king of kings. And in today's section on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to show us how to be liberated from lust. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 5 is where we're at. Let me read it for you. Verse 27, it says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in her heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the members then your whole body go to hell. Here's the principle that we learned from our text this morning. Love magnifies, lust diminishes. Love magnifies, lust diminishes. And we live in an age where that is countercultural. We live in an age where erotica is popular. We live in an age where erotica and lust is displayed and sought after. Look at the commercials that you watch. You could be selling microwavable food and it's, it's the way they appeal to you is a sex appeal. Cars are sold through sex appeal. Whatever you need to buy, it's, they use sex appeal to sell it. It's in the books that are written. It's in the websites that are being created. It's the restaurants that appeal more to more than just your hunger for food. Can I suggest to you that lust is no respecter of persons. The most in, intelligent submit to its simplest appeals. Cultured people, educated people, successful people are addicted to the crudest of pornography. The resume of victims that have fallen and destroyed their lives, their families, their careers is quite impressive. Just this week, there was a pastor in, a, in our city that was caught in prostitution and had to resign from his church and it was all over the news. It destroys successful people. It destroys unsuccessful people. It doesn't respect who you are or where you are in life. The lust for power caused Lucifer to plunge from the heights of heaven to the depths of hell. The lust for forbidden fruit cost Adam and Eve paradise. The lust for a woman cost destroyed the lives of David and Samson. Solomon was the wisest person ever to live, but his lust brought him to a foolish end. Many are the saints who have sacrificed their lives, their families, their reputations, their careers on altars for immediate gratification. So listen, this morning you'll never hear a more critical sermon than this. Jesus, Jesus tackles the issue of adultery, but what he says in our text goes far deeper than what we think the definition of adultery is. This sermon is for you if you're young. It's for you if you're old. It's for you if you're married. It's for you if you're single. And in this text, he tells us several things about adultery and lust. Number one, he talks about the act of adultery. The act of adultery. In verse 27, he says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. Notice, he doesn't say it is written. And what I think what he's trying to get to us is there's a lot of what we believe that's tradition. It wasn't in scripture, 
If we say something long enough, it becomes tradition. Then it becomes a substitute for the truth of the gospel. There's a lot of us church folks who believe too much stuff that's not based in Scripture. And Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And so what's the act of adultery? In an age where Christians have a higher divorce rate than non-church people and there's so much confusion in culture and church of what marriage is supposed to be about, we need to know what the Bible says about this or we'll be swept, swept away to sea. Over in Matthew 19, Jesus was being challenged by the religious leaders on the topic of divorce. And Jesus goes and he defines adultery by going back to the words of God in Genesis 2, where God institutes marriage for the first time. And here's what Moses says in Genesis 2. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's not tradition. That's scripture. That's truth. That's in the Bible. But notice there's three verbs there. You're supposed to leave. You're supposed to cleave. And then you're supposed to become one flesh. There are three distinctive parts in marriage. Number one, there's commitment. A man and woman leaves his father and mother. Just as we say in our marriage vows, forsaking all others. That's part of your vows. The second part is a covenant. That's the cleaving part. Where a man and a woman make a covenant before God and witnesses and friends and family to give yourself only unto each other in sickness and in health, in richer or for poorer, in good times and in bad times, as long as you both shall live. That's covenant. It's committing to live the rest of your life as a promise to God and to each other in front of witnesses that it's just the two of you. There's no one else. And then there's consummation. This is the becoming one flesh, the sexual intimacy part of the marriage bed, where marriage, where you are intimate with one another. Notice the order in Scripture. It's commitment, then it's covenant, then it's consummation. Can I suggest to you that we have reversed the entire thing in our culture? We begin with consummation or sex. Then we move in with each other to figure out if we're compatible and if we can make a lifelong commitment. Then maybe after a while, you might or might not enter into a covenant of marriage. And sadly, media and the arts have shaped our view of marriage and our marriage culture, and the church is following close behind. Over in Genesis, when marriage was first instituted, God said that marriage is between man and a woman. So what is the act of adultery? It is any violation of God's design for sexual intimacy. It is only for the marriage bed. It is only for a monogamous lifetime covenant of marriage. And it's only after a marriage ceremony. That means sex before marriage is adultery. That means sex with anyone who is not your covenant partner, who is not your spouse, is adultery. That means remarriage after an unbiblical divorce is adultery. That means sex with someone in your mind is adultery. The Greek word that Jesus uses for adultery in verse 27 is porneia, which is where we get the word pornography. So that's the act of adultery. Secondly, the mind of adultery. The mind of adultery. In verse 28, Jesus says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in her, with her in his heart. Listen, is looking necessarily lust? If I saw this woman as good-looking, does that mean that I'm lusting after her? God created us as sexual beings. He hardwired us to admire and to appreciate beauty. To find others attractive is normal. We need to be careful of being ensnared by false guilt. Some of us are overly guilty for unnecessary reasons. Unpack Jesus' words here. He says, looks at a woman lustfully. The Greek word there for looks is a continuous, active tense. You're just staring. You can't stop staring. And in your mind, all sorts of things are going on. In other words, this is a continual look, not a glance. It's a long, intense stare. 
Every woman knows what it's like to have a man look at them in such a way that they know that the person is mentally undressing them or um, thinking thoughts that are totally inappropriate. The Greek word for lustfully is made up of two words. The first word means to fix your eyes on something with such intensity or to grab on so firmly that you won't let go. The second word means with burning passion. Taken together, this Greek word combination means grab hold on to something with burning passion and not let go. Listen, not all lust is bad. Sometimes you've got to have a fire in your belly and grab hold of something for all that it's worth. No runner will ever run a race without lusting for the finish line, without being passionate to get it. C.S. Lewis, if you don't know by now, is probably one of my guys I quote the most here, other than Jesus. But um, uh, here's, he mocks this idea that all lust is bad. And he rewrites Jesus' words in verse 28. He says, he that looketh on a plate to lust after ham and eggs has already committed breakfast in his heart. So you might say, all hunger is a form of lust. Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, said curiosity is the lust of the mind. Unless we lust it after knowledge, there will be no progress in the world. We should especially lust after the things of God. Just before he died, um, Alistair Crowley said, I can imagine myself on my deathbed, spent utterly with the lust to touch heaven, to see God like a boy asking for his first kiss from a woman. It's not lust that's the issue. It's the object of lust that's the sin. And here in our text, Jesus is dealing with two sins and two commandments in one. The first, the seventh commandment isn't the only one in the Ten Commandments that deals with adultery. The Tenth Commandment also deals with it. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet his manservant or maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The Hebrew word for covet literally means to go after something until you get it. The Greek version of the Old Testament word translates with the same word that Jesus uses for lust here in our text. Jesus is tying the seventh and the tenth commandment together. And in doing so, he tells us three things about adultery. Three things that we need to understand. Number one, Adultery goes beyond another man's wife. It goes beyond another person's spouse. When Jesus speaks about looking at a woman lustfully, it's not confined to a woman. It could be a man looking at another man lustfully. It could be looking at a child lustfully. It could be a number of things. A neighbor's house, his donkey, his ox, his car, his whatever. Looking at it in a way that you will go after it because you want it. It goes beyond just another person. Secondly, it reminds us that what we possess, we have because that's what God wanted to give us. I have no right to that which God has given to someone else. What I have in my life is what God has chosen to bless me with. And again, this doesn't just go to the idea of another person or a woman or another man. The job that I have, it is God who blessed me with it. I have no desire, I have no right to demand from God a job that someone else has. Thirdly, lust is a sign of discontent. Dissatisfaction with what I have. Can I say also that lust is a sign of a lack of trust in the God who has given you what you have. Because if you truly believe that it is God who provides you with everything that you have, if you truly believe, husbands and wives, that it is God who brought the two of you together, then when you lust after something else or someone else, what you are literally saying is, I don't trust God. I don't trust that God brought the person to me. I don't trust that God gave me this. I don't trust that God is the one who provided for me. Society drives us crazy with lust and then calls it advertising. We're bombarded with media images and sales pitch that reminds us that we deserve better stuff, more stuff, newer stuff, and even somebody else's stuff. 
You remember the old motto from McDonald's, you deserve a break today? That's the perfect description for the entitlement age that we live in. Adultery is born with a, the grass is greener on the other side mentality. But the truth is, the grass is never greener on the other side. Lust is born of a union of fantasy and discontent. And by definition, fantasy is false. Adultery is first fought in the mind when we turn to biblical thinking and saying, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with what you have given me. I trust you that you are faithful to give me everything that I need. And cling to, wit, cling to God with what we've got. All right, let's go to the heart of adultery, number three. The heart of adultery. See, it'd be easy if we could only defeat lust in the mind. But Jesus actually makes this very complicated for us. He doesn't like to make things easy for us. In verse 28, he says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. Notice carefully the sentence flow here. Jesus is saying that before someone has committed the act of adultery, he or she already thought about it, the lust of the mind, but before she even thought about it, they already had a heart of adultery. What he's saying is that lust flows out of the inside of you. It comes from your heart. You remember the words in Matthew 15 where Jesus says, for out of the heart comes Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. That comes inside of you before it ever shows up on the outside. It comes from your heart. Your heart is corrupt. We're born with this heart. David was consumed with lust for Bathsheba. Pornographic images filled his thoughts, and he played all of these mind games in his mind. When he couldn't stand it anymore, he finally went and he took her. And when the consequences of adultery came crashing down, he tried to cover it up with murder. And in the aftermath of his great moral failure, here's what he said. He said in Psalm 51, surely I was a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Listen, in every baby beats a little heart of adultery. We don't want to think that. We want to think our babies are innocent and pure. But do you realize that all of us are born with corrupt hearts? Out of our hearts flow anger and jealousy and wrath and sexual immorality. From the earliest days, our hands grasped for things that weren't supposed to be ours. We screamed when we didn't get what we wanted. From the time we first walked, we would walk into places that were off limits. The thing that mom and dad said we couldn't have were the things that we wanted the most. We were born with Adam and Eve's desire and love for the things that were forbidden. We're all like that. That's the way we were. We are. See, we might try to hide our adultery or our lusting under a cloak of responsibility or even under the cloak of religion. But the same heart that pulsates in the heart of a prostitute or the heart of a pornographer beats in every church member's heart, every church elder's heart, every church pastor's heart. We're all going through this. That's why we shouldn't be shocked when someone falls into sexual sin. That's why we have to be careful to remember the biblical mandate, to, that warning to guard our hearts above everything else. Do you realize in Scripture that every saint that fell in Scripture, almost every one of them that fell to lust fell almost after the age of 55. They were, it wasn't when they were like a teenager. It wasn't like when they had little kids or they were in midlife crisis. They were past that stage. David was way past that stage when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. So the, the biblical command to flee from the lust of your youth we also need to flee the lusts of our older age as well. See, this is a heart issue. It's not, hey, don't look at pornography on the computer. It's not that simple. It's not, hey, don't look at a woman lustfully. It's not, hey, don't undress that man in your mind. It's deeper than that. 
And there's no amount of remedy or um, prescriptions or whatever that we can do on the outside to fix it. It's a heart issue. See, this is what Jesus is getting at in our text. We looked at it last time with anger. It's not just, hey, don't be angry anymore. It's a heart issue. It's, I've got to give you a new heart if you're going to be a follower of me. You can't just assume that you're just going to do this on your own. I've got to change you. It's a heart issue. So we go from there to number four, the seriousness of adultery. Man, what Jesus says in this text should leave us breathless. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Jesus wants us to know that lust is serious business. It defiles, it degrades, it debilitates, it destroys other people. Lust, lust does everything the opposite of love. So Jesus says, if your eyes, it's your eyes that causes you to lust, gouge it out. If your hand is about to reach out and grab hold of something or someone that doesn't rightly belong to you, cut it off. Strong language here. Extreme remedies. Now, before you do that, Jesus doesn't mean for you to take this literally. He wasn't literally talking about you going and cutting your hand off and saying, well, Jesus told me to do it. Um, he wants you to take it seriously. He wants you to understand how important this is. Your eternity hangs in the balance. He wants to remind you there's a heaven to be gained, a hell to be lost. Don't literally gauge your gouge your eyes out, but do close your eyes to the things that tempt you. Do find people to hold you accountable to say, I'm not that, hey, I'm struggling with this. I need help. Hold me accountable. Do, don't cut off your hand, but you may need to permanently cut off a relationship that's leading you down the wrong path. And he's reminding us that there are worse things than blindness or losing your limb. Sin may bring pleasure for a moment, but the consequences can last for generations to come and even find their way all the way to the judgment seat of God. It's a serious issue. He says, how you view your sexuality is important to me because it reflects to the world that you belong to me, that you, just as much as I love you, you value and honor and give worth to the people around you, to the things around you. Number five, the impossibility of adultery. When Jesus speaks about plucking off your eyes and cutting off your hands, he's using a hyperbole, speaking in the extreme to make an extreme point. Everything he said about adultery has been leading his, sinners, his listeners to this point. You can take out your eye, you can cut off your hand, but that's not going to solve the problem. The ultimate dilemma is the heart of adultery. How do we cut that out and still live? How do we take our heart out and still live? I never understood what Jesus was saying until there was an article in People magazine a couple years ago. It was a group of blind men that would be taken on a bus to Vegas. And they get to Vegas and they go to the strip club, blind people. They're going to a strip club. And even though they're blind and even though they can't see a thing, that's where they're at. And after the show, they're led backstage to meet the girls. The photo in, in People showed these men trying to reach out and grope these women, with their hands. They couldn't see, but they could feel. Now, let's be honest. If you had cut their hands off, the little remaining stump, stumps that were there would be probably try to reach out and touch these women as well. It matters little if you took out your eyes, if you cut off your hands, because the heart of adultery still remains. Martin Luther, the reformer, said he went to a monastery to shield his eyes from lust. 
He whipped his flesh with whips, dipped in ice-cold ponds into freezing water, and punctured his flesh with rose thorns. But nothing he did could cool down the hot lust that tormented him. Listen, our cultured responsibility, our religion, is just a thin covering that shields the heart of darkness that's inside of us. See, the point that Jesus is trying to make is that you're not going to be able to do this on your own. You're not going to be able to overcome lust on your own. David saw it when he sinned in Bathsheba. He cried out in Psalm 51. This is David's cry. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He doesn't say, take out these desires or give me or make me a new person. He says, give me a new heart. Give me a heart that only you can give. And see, what Jesus does when he does this, he drives us all the way back to the first beatitude. Remember what it was? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus, I have nothing that I can bring to solve this. I'm bankrupt. I have no resources. I have no ability. I've tried everything possible. I've tried turning off the computer screen. I've tried fleeing. I've tried everything. I come broken. He drives us back to the Beatitudes. And we'll see this over and over over the next several weeks, that he'll keep driving us back to say, you've got nothing. You didn't need yourself. You're absolutely dependent on me. And he says, when you're poor in spirit, the next thing that needs to happen is you need to mourn. You need to mourn over it, and you need to be reduced to the third beatitude, which is an attitude of meekness. Only then will you do the next beatitude, which is hunger and thirst for righteousness that can only be found in Jesus. See, you need a heart transplant. And that's the next beatitude where Jesus says, I'm going to give you a pure heart. I'm going to give you my heart. But even that's not enough. The old habits, the sins, the desires, the lusts, still cling to the old flesh. They don't die easily. We still need his presence and power to help us. But we will also have to help ourselves. It will require lots of prayers. It will require lots of accountability. It will require a lot of work on our part. We'll have to learn what the Bible says, put it into practice. Even in a world that tells us that we are out of step and old-fashioned when we say that we're reserving ourselves and saving ourselves for marriage, that we're going to honor people, we're not just going to degrade people, that we're not just going to use people, that we're going to honor the people that God has brought into our lives. And the world says, that's countercultural. We're going to say, we want to follow Jesus. We will have to avoid the temptations that are unique to us, cut off the things that are so prone to ensnare us. We'll have to pursue God, his holiness. Guys, this is serious business because the old itches in our lives don't die easily. But God rewards those who take these things seriously by giving them the kingdom of heaven. Remember, lust diminishes. Love magnifies. Bunnies are not rodents. And we are made for better things as well. See, the promise of Scripture is not, you don't have to do this alone. The promise of Scripture is that I am with you. I am faithful. That he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. There's two parts here. One, you are broken and you say, God, I, have, I need your help to do this. The other part is you saying, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do and be obedient. See, some of us are just hoping that God will miraculously just zap us and this lust will go away. And that's not how it works. You don't just pray it away, right? I mean, I've used this illustration before. If you see a pornographic image on your computer screen, you don't just um, put your hands toward it and pray that it disappears. You turn it off. That makes more sense. Right? I mean, you, there's some stuff you run from. You, there's some stuff you just don't allow to get into your mind. And sometimes, if we think that, oh, no one else will know about it, no one else will find out about it, you know, that will destroy you more 
because you'll think, oh, it won't hurt anyone. And the reality is if you don't address it, you single guys, if you don't address it now, it's going to be a problem for your marriage. It will destroy your marriage. It's a reality. It will destroy your view of women. It will destroy your view of men. It will destroy your expectations of your marriage. See, this is something that you address now. You don't say, ah, it doesn't hurt anyone but me. It will. If you don't address it now, it will. I have sat in services in a church where the pastor confessed of his moral failures and resigned. And I've seen the church devastated. I've seen it shrink from thousands of people to literally hundreds of people, the consequences of that. I worked in a counseling center. I've seen marriages where they've come in and adultery destroyed their marriages. And you go back to the root of it, it's always something where they thought, oh, no one will ever know. No one will ever find out. It's just between me and myself. It's not hurting anyone. But that little sin became a little bigger sin and became a bigger sin and became a bigger sin, and it destroyed everything about them. You guys, that this is serious. And Jesus wants you to take it serious because your life matters. Your testimony that you belong to Jesus matters. Your worth matters. How you treat other people matters. And so Jesus says, don't take this lightly. This is some of the strongest languages in Scripture. Pluck out your eye. Cut off your hand. You can't get stronger in language than that. He's saying, this is important. This is things that you need to take seriously. So let me encourage you. If you're struggling with this, and you think, oh, no one will ever find out, can you get that mindset out of your mind? Can you start holding yourself accountable or having people hold you accountable? Because the moment you start sharing it with other people, there's at least someone else that's praying for you, and there's someone else that's going to get on your case to hold you accountable. Go to God. Ask for help. He loves to help. And sometimes the way he helps is through other people. If you're really struggling, come to me. We've got resources that we can help you with. Do not let this sin destroy you. Do not think that it's not a big deal now, that when I get married, it'll be fine, that I don't have to have that itch anymore. It's not going to be fine. Address it now. Address it immediately. Just for the sake of your marriage, but for the sake of your love for Jesus. If you love Jesus, why? If you love Jesus, why? Why do you want to linger in it? Why do you think it's not a big deal? When Jesus says it is a big deal. Address it now. Let me encourage you. Number one, trust God. He is faithful. He is absolutely good. He will help you. Number two, get, find people that hold you accountable. Get help. Find the resources. You know how I know God's faithful? Our communion table reminds us. Because every week we remind ourselves that when we couldn't do it, when we couldn't make it, we serve a God who took our place. We serve a God who said, I will become sin. And I will take the penalty of their sin so that they can be sons and daughters of God. So this morning when we come to the communion table, we're not just celebrating the fact that Jesus died for us. We're celebrating the fact that because Jesus died for us, we have the ability and the opportunity to live a life that's drastically different than being enslaved to the powers of sin. His resurrection guarantees a brand new life for us. So this morning I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitude, your affections, if there's anything in your life that's not like Jesus, would you repent? Would you run to Jesus and would you ask him for help? And as you do, whenever you feel ready, I invite you to come grab the elements from either side and we'll come back together here in a few moments and we'll partake of the table together. But examine your hearts. Would you let the Holy Spirit work on you this morning? Let me pray.
Father, this morning as we are here, I've, I'm trusting that your spirit is working in our hearts. God, for some of us in this room, the issue of lust might be the issue of desiring a woman or a guy or whatever it may be. God, um, we need your help. We need you to help us. Father, for others of us, lust might be we want a bigger house or a better job or um, a nicer car or, God, for those of us in ministry, a bigger church or whatever it may be. And, Father, that at the root shows us that we don't trust you with what you've given us. And so, God, we ask that you would forgive us. Help us to trust that you know what is good for us. Help us to trust that we serve a God who loves to take care of us. Help us to trust that we serve a God who knows our future, not just our present. And that what we have today is what you desire for us today. And if there's something else we need in your time, you will give that to us. So Father, this morning as a church, is our prayer that you would help us to trust you. Help us to trust that you are good. Help us to trust that when you say it, it is the best thing. So Father, forgive us of our unbelief and help us in our struggles this morning. As we come to the table, we thank you for Jesus our Savior who lived life absolutely trusting you. Who fought off every type of temptation that we would ever face and won the battle and lived life perfectly and died death so gruesomely so that Our destination is no longer hell, but we belong to you. So, Father, this morning, we thank you for Jesus. We love you.